So we're talking about technology. Let's get into this. Uh, a few months ago, I was watching a YouTube clip of Ninja streaming Fortnite on Twitch, which is probably the most 2019 thing I could possibly say. Uh, some of you know exactly what I mean. Some of you are like, what did he just say? So I'll explain, I'll explain. Uh, first of all, there's a very popular game right now, video game called Fortnite. Some of you, know, you guys play it, you know, you know all about Fortnite. Um, but one of the things that's happened recently, which is so interesting, is that there are some video gamers, people who play full-time, who have actually made a business out of streaming their games, and other people will pay to watch them play the game. Okay, this is just a trend. I know it's kind of crazy for some people to think about, but this is a big deal. And one of those streamers is a guy who goes by Ninja. I doubt that's his actual name. I don't, I don't think that's his real name. But Ninja, he's a very, very good video gamer, and uh, a ton of people follow him. In fact, at his peak on Twitch, this streaming platform, he had 14 million followers. 14 million people who were paying to watch him play video games, okay? Now, just to get a sense of how big of a deal Ninja is, uh, it's estimated that in 2018, that he, just by doing video game stuff and sponsorships and ads, that he made two, uh, $10 million in one year, okay, playing video games. So I was watching him play one time and I was very fascinated to see how this whole streaming thing was going, this whole video game streaming, because um, when people subscribe to watch him, they can interact with him as he plays. I think he has his computer screen here where he's playing and over here, he's got the, the stream feed where people can add, ask questions or whatever. And so what I quickly began to realize based on the context of their questions is that many, if not most of his followers were around the age of middle school. They were middle school students. And what people would do is they'd ask a question, but they, they'd get bumped to the top if they made a donation, you know, got to make money. So they made a donation and then they could ask a question. And so many of these questions were middle schoolers asking about relationships. Like, Ninja, what do I do about, you know, I, I really like this girl. How do I ask her out? Uh, someone else asked him and he's, you know, running around uh, while he's playing, running around with like guns and stuff in Fortnite. And they asked him, uh, I promise, no sense of irony. They, they asked him, uh, uh, man, I'm, I'm so angry. This guy stole my girlfriend. I just, I just want to go punch him in the face. And Ninja, seriously, I'm telling you this happened. He's like, he's like, look, bro, like you gotta deal with your emotions. You know, you can't, you can't just, uh, can't just resort to violence. <laughs> and he shot and killed a guy. And, and so, okay, so it was, it was funny. It was crazy. I'm watching this happen. But then I began to realize something really interesting. Okay, this guy, Ninja, he was influencing young minds, wasn't he? Was it? He was an influencer. But I mean, now nothing he said was necessarily like bad or wrong or, or sinful. I didn't hear anything that I was like, uh oh, red flag. I mean, probably the worst thing that he's doing is convincing a generation of young people that they have a future in professional gaming. Uh, but they were worshiping the ground he walks on. And here's what I realized. This 28-year-old man was shaping the worldview of middle school students. And he was, he was framing their understanding of morality and engaging with, with members of the opposite sex. Why? because he was good at video games. That was why he had this tremendous influence, because he was good at video games. And what it did is it kind of illustrated for me a reality that we are all facing in this world, and that is the fact that there is a tremendous amount of influence coming our way every day, and it is not necessarily from people who have a right to influence us in that way, right? Not everybody who is an influencer today should probably be an influencer. And I know, I know some of you are thinking like, oh, of course, but I, I'm not going to be influenced by a video game guy, right? I'm not watching Ninja. No, but I can guarantee you, if we looked into your life, we would find a lot of pretty significant influences that are coming your way that are shaping you, whether you realize it or not. We are under influence. We're being influenced. And some of it's more than we could possibly even know. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about influence and what do we do about it? Because we are in uh, week four of our series, The Good Life Technology. So far, your feedback has been great. People have, re you guys have really enjoyed this series, and I have too. Um, it's really relevant because we are living in a very technological world. We're constantly connected, and, and it's really good for us to look at these, these biblical principles, these five biblical principles of how to have a healthy life if we're going to follow Jesus in this digital world. Um, so let me just bring you up to speed if you're just joining us uh, and kind of recap where we've been so far. 
In week one, we kind of laid the groundwork for this whole series by saying that ultimately, our job as followers of Jesus is not to just abandon technology, right? We're not just going to burn it all to the ground and walk away because we can't. We are in the world. We are sent into the world, even if we're not of the world. So our job is not to abandon technology, but to transform it. Right? We are light bringers. We're bringing light into the darkness and, and shining light into the darkness in the name of Jesus. Um, so in other words, our, our principle number one was this. You are on a mission. First and foremost, when you think about technology, remember that you are on a mission. Now in week two, we talked about how important it is to remember uh, where your identity comes from. With social media telling us who we are, it is so important to remember principle two that your identity is in Christ, not in likes. Remember, your identity is in Christ, not in likes. Last week, I introduced the idea of Sabbath, the idea of, of taking sacred time to stop the hamster wheel, to stop the, the addictive cycles of our technology, and to remember that we're free people, that we are not slaves to our technology. And so that's why, by the way, we did our No Screen Saturday Challenge because the principle that week was Sabbath breaks chains. Sabbath breaks chains. And we wanted to give you guys an opportunity to experience that. Uh, again, I don't know how many of you guys ended up actually doing the No Screen Saturday Challenge or if you did it, how hardcore you were about it. But I felt like I better practice what I preach. So I kept my phone turned off and I didn't even take it with me when I went out for the whole day yesterday. And I gotta say, it was weird. <laughs> it was really weird. I didn't think it was going to be as weird as it was, but um, I had to print out paper maps to get around to, you know, do uh, directions. At one point, I actually had to look up into the sky to see where the sun was so I knew which way was east. <laughs> it was like, I'm a pioneer. This is like the early 2000s are back, you know? And so I, uh, I that's when I was kind of driving and stuff. Anyway, like I got my license in the late 90s and we didn't have internet. Okay, so I was like really surprised to see, first of all, how often I kept checking for my phone. I, I kept, you know, you that little, that little fear, that kind of anxiety that comes over you when you're like, <gasps> like, where is it? I keep my phone in this pocket. Right. So uh, that was happening to me a lot. And I, I, I discovered that, man, I have a lot of extra time now. <laughs> I don't know if you guys dis discovered this, but I, I realized I spend so much of my day, whenever I have like an idle moment between things, I pull out my phone, check Twitter, that turns into five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, without having any of those little check-ins. I kept looking up at the clock and thinking, it's only 11.30? What in the world? This day is lasting forever. So that was kind of cool. I'm still processing it. I'll still be thinking about it. I, did, I do have to confess, I did... Uh, I did mess up when I backed up my car and my reverse monitor came on and I was like, shoot, I looked right down at that screen. So it wasn't a perfect day, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot. So here's what I'm gonna ask. Uh, if you did that, or if you're gonna do it sometime in, in some form or fashion, will you share that with us? And I know you're gonna roll your eyes at me, but will you share it with us on social media? Because I would love to know uh, like what your experience was like. What did you learn? So on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, let us know uh, what your experience was like, because I, would, I think it would be valuable for us to learn from one another here. Okay, so Sabbath breaks chains. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, reconnecting with real life people. And this is kind of crazy that we have to talk about this, but we do. We have to remember principle number five, that face to face is best. And so we're going to get into that and talk about how to reconnect with authentic relationships. Um, and as a reminder, by the way, we have uh, a couple of resources that we're offering to you. First of all, on our website, gracechurch.us slash thegoodlife, we have a whole bunch of different resources and podcasts and apps and things for you to explore if you want to think about this stuff some more. Um, but we're also having our Parents Technology Forum on December 3rd. Um, Parents Technology Forum, that'll be at the Fishers campus. And this is going to be a chance for us to talk more specifically about the realities of, of how do we raise kids in this technological world. And someone last night pointed this out to me. I think it was brilliant. The fact that this is not just for parents, this would be a great thing for grandparents too. Because if you're a grandparent, it means that your kids are having to deal with what to do with their kids. So this will be an opportunity for us to all have that kind of a discussion. So there's more uh, good stuff to come, in other words. And if you want to check out the website, you'll get all the info you need. Okay, but today, today we are talking about influence. Influence. So let's get into that. The truth is, uh, every one of us, like I mentioned, is being constantly affected by a never-ending stream of influence. It's just part of being in, in this technological world. 
Now, some of it is obvious. You'd look at it and you'd think, well, of course that's influencing me, whether or not I like it, it is. Um, for example, uh, pundits on the news channel, the talking heads that, that on the news channel that are uh, always feeding into your perspective, if you're someone who watches cable news, or um, social media influencers that talk about their favorite brands, uh, or, or you know, marketing or advertisements. Like, we know that, that even though we're not always trying to be like, uh, you know, falling on every word that they say, we know that there's a reason why we have an emotional connection to a shampoo brand, and it's because we've been influenced by these advertisements and social media influencers, right? All of that is, is uh, out there, it's open. We all would acknowledge that that's there. But there's also a kind of much more subtle influence that does trickle into our subconscious. And these are the kinds of things like the, the moral code that's hinted at by our music lyrics, or uh, the philosophical underpinnings of the YouTubers that we follow, or the, the worldview of our favorite podcast hosts. Again, we're not necessarily uh, thinking about this, but as we hear these people that we listen to over and over and over again, as they talk about their worldview, guess what starts to happen? Our worldview starts to be shaped and changed to look a little bit more like theirs. You see, we're, we're being influenced whether we realize it or not. In this technological age, I would argue that who we are and how we live is shaped by this barrage of influences, and it's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. Unless you live in like a remote off-grid cabin in the woods with no connection to the outside world and no internet, this is just a part of your life now. Influence. So let me start with this. I just want to lay this out there. The problem is not that you're being influenced. The fact is, we live in this world, we're going to be influenced. So that's not the problem. The problem is that far too few of us actually think about who or what we are letting influence us. You see, we don't, we, don't, we don't consciously even give this any thought. We just let these influences flow in. So I think this is the problem because we are called, as I've said in this series already, we are called to be distinct from this dark world around us, right? We are called to be different, to be set apart, to be holy. So it's a problem when the dark world around us influences us and we don't give it a second thought. If we are going to be light bringers, then we had actually better be uh, filled with light and not darkness ourselves. So I'm going to say today that we have to think and give more intentional thought to who and what influences us. But I didn't just make that up. I think that comes straight out of the words of Scripture. So we're going to look at a passage in, in uh, Colossians uh, chapter 3, which I think is going to be a really valuable one. If you have a house Bible that you want to use in one of the seats in front of you, it's going to be page 988. Had, couldn't look up at the screen to, to, to get that. I usually do. Um, Colossians 3. Now, this is is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in the city of Colossae, which is in Anatolia, which that was what it was called back then, uh, or Western Turkey, where it, it would be Western Turkey today. It was a smallish city, not like, not like a super big one, but um, this city was part of a cloud of other cities in the area that were all being influenced by some cultural trends that were going on. And particularly in Colossae, the Christians there, the church there, was starting to be influenced in some kind of weird ways. There was this stuff that I would call, I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is the technical term, but I would call it syncretistic mysticism. And I know that's crazy. What it means is that they were taking all of these elements from other religions and stuff, and they were kind of mixing it all together uh, to make some sort of new hybrid Christianity. So what they would do is they, they said, yeah, okay, we're going to take some elements of Judaism. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit of Jesus, and then we're also going to worship elemental spirits, and we're going to impose these really crazy strict rules on everybody, and, and we're going to be uh, letting a bunch of immorality come in because it's okay because we're worshiping the elemental spirits, and the fire spirit told me to do it. And it was very weird stuff, and it was really divine dividing the church. So this influence was shaping the church in Colossae, and the Apostle Paul knows that he has to say something about this. That's one of the reasons he wrote this letter. Uh, so let's read Colossians 3, starting at verse 1, and I'll, I'll show you how he responds to this flow of influence. He says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. 
So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now it is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. All right, we'll stop there for today. So one thing, if you read the Apostle Paul a lot, you'll see he does one thing a lot. He loves to do this. He sets up uh, contrasts. He will set up two contrasting realities and then talk about it. Uh, you know, old and new, light and dark, life and death. You know, all of Paul's letters, he does this. And here, he's doing it again. If you look at verse 2, he contrasts the things of heaven, or literally the, the things above, with the things of earth. The things of heaven and the things of earth. Now, I want to make something clear because I know where our minds go when we hear things of heaven. I know what we're thinking about, but that's not what Paul was thinking about. Heaven, in Paul's mind, was not just some ethereal place full of, you know, angels and harps. Okay, that was not what he heaven meant to him. Heaven, for Paul, heaven is the place where God reigns. It's where he dwells, where his rule and his, his reign as the king is total. Heaven is the realm of life and peace and joy and harmony and wholeness and, and, and love. That's what heaven is. And in Paul's mind, heaven is not some place that we're all just going to zip off to when we die. No, heaven is actually a, a, a reality that is coming to transform this earth. The kingdom of God is coming. It's breaking into our world. That's what this means. Uh, he, Paul talks a lot about the fact that this has already begun through Jesus, through his death and his resurrection. Paul talks that our, our, our new creation, this, this transformation of our reality has already begun and is happening and is happening through the church. So that's what Paul is talking about. When he says the realities of heaven, he's talking about the realities of the kingdom of God, of this new creation, of God's rule and reign. And that, that is what we are supposed to think about. Things of heaven. Well, why? Look at, look at verse 3. Paul talks about this in the past tense. He says, because you died to this earthly life. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. In the chapter before this, he talks all about uh, the, the uh, resurrection that's symbolized by baptism. And so here, he's basically saying, look, when you went under that water and you came out, you made it clear that you were dead to your old life, and now your new life is a part of heaven. It's a part of this, this coming kingdom. But not just as a future hope, although it is that, but as a present reality. The moment that you give your life to Jesus, the moment you say, I'm going to follow you, follow Jesus, you become a citizen of heaven. We've, we talked about this back in May. Your status changes. You suddenly, you don't belong here anymore. You belong to heaven, even as you live here. You, as a follower of Jesus, are now a participant in that coming new creation. And as Paul says elsewhere, God is now shaping you shaping you to be conformed to the image of his son. That's how he says it in Romans 8. Conformed to the image of his son, which means that when you follow Jesus over time, your life is supposed to look more and more and more like his. Under Christ's influence, you are meant to become a light bringer in this world because that's what he is. He is a light bringer in this world, and so we are meant to be light bringers just like him. Which is why Paul has such strong words for those who say they follow Jesus, but instead spend all their time thinking about or, or setting their sights on or being influenced by the things of the earth. The things of the earth. And what are those things? Well, Paul essentially lumps them into two big categories here. You could call them uh, sins of desire and sins of disunity. Okay, sins of desire. He's got these two categories. Look at verse 5. 
He describes these, these sins of desire as these are the kinds of sins that corrupt our hearts. They're internal. Uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, right? These corrupt us internally. But in verse 8, he describes sins of disunity, and these are the sins that disrupt and, and corrupt the church, the church. Uh, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language, lying. These are the kinds of things which keep a community from thriving. That's what these sins do. But here's what I don't want you to miss. Uh, we, we hear these, these lists of sins, and I know, I know that we tend to think, okay, there goes old prudish Paul telling us we're not allowed to have any fun, right? We, we think of these lists as some list of God rules that you're not really supposed to break, but I know we all kind of do sometimes. That's not what he's talking about here. That is not what Paul is doing. He's not being moralistic. No, these, these sins that he talks about, these are actions and thoughts which directly undermine that new creation, that, that kingdom of God. Think about it. Think about it. In the new creation, uh, I'll give you an example. In, in heaven, in God's kingdom, every human being has dignity and value, right? We, we have dignity and value in God's kingdom because that's, because we are beloved children of God. So what does lust do? Lust decreases our value. It, 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 it uh, you know, it takes someone and it objectifies them. It turns them into an object and suddenly they lose their dignity. They're not beloved children of God, they're objects. That's what lust does. It undermines the kingdom of God. Or another example, in, in the new creation, in the kingdom, there's no need. There's no need because everybody gives of themselves with love and generosity. Because of that, there's abundance. We all share what we have. But greed, it undermines that, doesn't it? In the midst of abundance, greed says, no, this is mine. This is mine, it's not yours. And by the way, I want more. I want more. That's what greed does. That, that dismantles what the kingdom of God is supposed to be about. One more example. In the new creation, peace and harmony, those are universal, right? It's a place, there, there's no discord between people. But suddenly, anger, rage, slander, these are the kinds of things that rip communities apart. So when Paul says that we must think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, this is not a trite, moralistic suggestion for us to try to ponder the afterlife more often. That's not what he's saying. No, he is saying that we, if we are in Christ, we've got to remember that we are a part of that new creation. We are citizens of God's kingdom that is coming into this world right now. We are citizens now and our lives should look like it. We should look like we are citizens of that coming kingdom. Now, our world today looks a little bit different than ancient Colossae, doesn't it? Well, for one thing, we've got fewer temple prostitutes and syncretistic angel cults, but there are other things too that are different, like our technology. But here's what I'll say. We are constantly being flooded by influences which are no less earthly than the things that, that Paul was talking about here. We're, we're experiencing no less earthly influences than Colossae. But here's the difference, the big difference. Thanks to technological advances, we have access to more of these influences than, than we ever did before. Think about what you're able to have with just a smartphone now. Immediately with your smartphone, you have access to extreme bigoted views that now have a, have a global platform. You can have pornography at your fingertips in seconds. Pride, greed, lust, violence, slander, rage. They're not just out there. They're not just present in social media. They are elevated and celebrated in our culture. Think about the shows that we watch, right? Th these influences are there. We also have syncretistic worldviews. They're different than Colossi, but there are a lot of people out there who are taking bits and pieces and kind of making their own little faith stew. And on top of it all, probably making it most complicated of all, there are countless ways now for us to hide our darkness and pretend that there's nothing wrong. We're not doing anything wrong, right? We can cover it over so easily. Sins of desire, sins of disunity, and all of them drawing us away, undermining the new creation life that we are meant to experience, but not just experience, but to resemble. They're undermining the ability of us to look like followers of Jesus. That, that, guys, is the world that we are letting flow right on in and influence us day after day after day. We are not giving it a second thought. That's an issue. So what do we do about it? What are we going to do about the fact that we've got all these influences, the things of the earth? Well, I believe we first have to just admit and understand 
something that I'm going to call the principle, principle number four for this whole series, and it's this. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. That uh, is actually, it started as a computer science term. This is, this is something they, when they were first creating computers, they had this phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Because basically, you could have the most pristine, beautiful, perfect piece of software, best program in the world, but if you fed it a bunch of garbage inputs, guess what you're going to get out the other side? A bunch of garbage results, right? It, it, the, the inputs have, have a, uh, an important part to play. Well, we're not computer programs, okay? We're more complicated than a piece of software, but if you feed in a bunch of things of the earth day after day after day, guess what's going to come out the other side? Things of the earth, out of your life, the way you live will be things of the earth. So we're really no different, Garbage in, garbage out. Now look, I am not here to be legalistic today. I am not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't be watching or reading or listening to. I'm not going to give you Barry's list of forbidden shows or something like that. I'm not going to do that. But, but I am going to agree with Paul here and say that if you want to live a healthy life in this world, in this digital world, if you want your life to look like Jesus— then you'd better start paying attention to what is influencing you. Is it garbage? Is it things of the earth? Do you know? Have you thought about it? That is what I'm asking us to think about. Look back at Colossians 3 one more time. Look at, look at some of the words, the verbs that he uses here. Set your sights on. Think about. Put on. Be renewed. Put to death. Get rid of. Strip off. What do all these words have in common? They're, they're action words, right? Right? These are, these are words that are not passive. They require intentionality and purpose. They don't just happen. If we want to think about the things of heaven, as Paul calls us to do, well, then we had better start by thinking about what we're thinking about. We had better put a little intentionality behind it. We so often, as I've said, we've so often let these influences flood into our minds and into our hearts without ever giving it a second thought. Those middle school students who were watching Ninja play and talk about relationships, they were watching because they wanted to see him frag some noobs. They wanted to see him blow people up. But what they were getting instead was a worldview about how to interact with people of the opposite sex, right? How to, how to date. That's what they were actually being influenced by, even though that's not why they were there. The same thing happens to all of us if we're not thinking critically about what's influencing us. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so how do you know if it's garbage? How do you know? Well, here's one way you can do it. One uh, tool that you can use. Now, I just came up with this. I have not actually tested this in, in for very, there's no market research behind this. I'm curious to know if this works for you, but I believe it could. This is a tool, a chart that I think you can use to begin kind of charting your influences and asking yourself critically whether what you're watching is garbage or not. All right, so let me, let me uh, introduce this to you. This is the... Uh, the influence chart. I don't have a good name for it yet. We'll come up with that. If you have an idea, let me know. On social media. No, just kidding. All right. So right over here, T-O-E, this is things of earth. Things of earth. And over here, T-O-H, this is things of heaven. So what this axis, the X axis represents, is how much does, the, does this influence, this particular influence, resemble the kingdom of God? How much does this resemble the intentions of God for this world and the coming new creation? Up here, the, the Y axis, we've got a bunch of exclamation points up here and a couple down here. What this means is how influential is this influence in your life? Is this the kind of thing that really shapes you? Or is this something that's just not really that much of, a, of an influence? It's kind of insignificant. Okay? So what what I'm suggesting is that you go through your influences and think about where they fall on this chart. Actually do this. I promise you it's worth doing. So for example, uh, let's think about mm, YouTube channels. YouTube channels. I personally am subscribed to The Bible Project. I think they're phenomenal. They do these incredible animated videos that, frankly, they, they're really biblically sound, and they have been an influence on me because they help to kind of inspire my, my artistic, creative side to think differently about how I'm reading Scripture. So I would put them, like, here. I would say The Bible Project as a YouTube channel, they are, they are things of heaven for sure, but they're also pretty influential in my life. On the other hand, I'm also subscribed to Fail Army. <laughs> and if you know Fail Army, it's just a compilation of people like doing stupid things and, and hurting themselves. And it's just stupid. It's really dumb. And, uh, but I can't help it. It's fun. Sometimes it's funny to watch. So definitely things of the earth, right? There's nothing really biblical about that. But at the same time, it doesn't influence me all that much. Like I don't 
I don't want to go jump off of things every time I watch Fail Army. So I'd say it's, it's relatively insignificant. I'll put it down here. So now imagine if you were to do that for all of the, the YouTube subscriptions that you have. Like, what would it look like? Where would you start putting all of your, your YouTube subscriptions? How would, your, how would your chart start to look? And now it doesn't have to be just for YouTube, though. It could be for anything. It could be for all the different social media feeds that you have. For example, if you know that when you go on Facebook, you're going to see someone's angry political rant, and you know that it makes you really angry to read it. Why, where would you put that on the chart? I would probably put that somewhere over here. And here's why. Here's why. It's definitely, uh, if we're talking about rage, it's right out of Colossians 3. If you're feeling rage when you're being influenced by something, that's a problem. But here's why it's influential. Because it's more likely after you read that rage-filled post that you are going to want to be rage-filled and angry with others. You're going to be more tempted to respond with anger than you would if you didn't see that. So perhaps that is an influence that goes up here. But you could also do this with some of, your, some of your spiritual influences. It doesn't just have to be technology. Think about, um, think about the, uh, the influence of, let's say, having K-Love on in the background at work, okay? There's a Christian music station. That's probably not going to change you very much. It might be, you know, it might be heavenly. It might be Christian music, but that doesn't necessarily change how you live. I, I'd say the same category would be like putting a Bible verse up in your bathroom, okay? It's not really going to shape you, even though it's directly from Scripture. Same thing would be true if you, if you come to church once every couple of months or something. Like if you're not really invested at church, you're not going to be shaped by it that much. And so you can start putting it down here. Now compare those things with being discipled by somebody. Actually walking through life with someone who is, who is shaping you and walking with you and teaching you what it means to follow Jesus. That is a heavenly influence. Like that's going to shape you in Jesus' name. That's going to be a really good thing. So is, you know, reading your Bible with your, your rooted group. So is uh, coming to church every single weekend. These are things that, that really do shape you and they also shape you to have a life that looks more like the kingdom of God. So consider doing this for all of your influences. Think about the dating app that you're using. Think about the, the music you're listening to and the podcasts you listen to. And then think about this. Two questions that you should ask with this chart. Number one, what does my chart look like? But probably more importantly, number two, what do I want my chart to look like? What do I want my influence chart to look like? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I know you're probably thinking, oh, okay, Barry thinks that we should put all of our influences up here. Look, I'm trying to be realistic here, okay? We live in a world full of influences. Unless you're some kind of like monk living in space, like a space monk, and you don't have any access to anything, then, then you're probably going to have influences in other parts of this chart, okay? So I'm not, again, I'm not being legalistic, but this chart is something important to pay attention to. If you look at your chart and there's nothing up here, that might be something worth paying attention to. Or, or if you think about your faith and all of your spiritual influences are down here and they're not really shaping you that much, that's also something to pay attention to, isn't it? Or if you fill out your chart and you are, this whole quadrant up here is just full of influential things that are nothing but things of the earth, that is something to pay attention to. Again, I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't listen to, but I am suggesting, as I think Paul would, that you look for ways to reduce the amount of garbage that's flowing into your mind that's influencing you, and that you look for ways to, to decrease the influence that it has over your life. At the same time, look for ways to fill your time and energy with things, things of heaven. Think about the things that resemble Christ, that resemble the new creation, so that you can be shaped and formed to be more like him. That is what I'm calling you to think about. What does your chart look like and what do you want it to look like? You know what we're talking about here. It's a, it's a biblical, theological kind of word. The word is sanctification. We're talking about sanctification, which means just becoming increasingly set apart, becoming more and more different from the world around you, Christ-like. Sanctified, be sanctified. Even as we remain in this broken technological world, as we're surrounded by the darkness, let's walk on a journey of sanctification so that we, as, as, as this dark world is surrounding us, we can be brighter and brighter with the light of Jesus. As Paul says in, in Colossians 3 verse 10, he says, let's be renewed. Be renewed as we learn to know our creator and become like him. What does your influence chart look like and what do you want it to look like? Look, technology, it may be here to stay. It's here to stay. 
but it does not have to tell us who we are. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.